Thanks for showing up. It's, I'd, I'd be outside if I were you, so maybe, uh, maybe we should question your ability to make good decisions. So back for one more. All right. I can't get enough. All right. Uh, so just the reminder, <laughs> your final reminder, and you're like, can we go to brunch now? No. <laughs> one week. Um, so components of a grown-up lens, uh, you've seen these before. I want to highlight the, the one about curiosity, because there's, there's this little piece from a book called Comfortable with Uncertainty by Pema Chodron that just kind of this little reflection that she shared that relates to this idea of curiosity, that every time I return to her words, there's just something um, that uh, just I guess something that inspires me, something that encourages me. So I, I want to share this with you as well. It's just a, a, a brief little piece called Lighten Up and Do Something Different. She writes this. Being able to lighten up is the key to feeling at home with your body, mind, and emotions, to feeling worthy to live on this planet. For example, you can hear the slogan, always maintain only a joyful mind and start beating yourself over the head for never being joyful. That kind of witness is a bit heavy. This earnestness, this seriousness about everything in our lives, including practice, this goal-oriented, we're going to do it or else attitude is the world's greatest killjoy. There's no sense of appreciation because we're so solemn about everything. In contrast, a joyful mind is very ordinary and relaxed. So lighten up. Don't make such a big deal. When your aspiration is to lighten up, you begin to have a sense of humor. Your serious state of mind keeps getting popped. In addition to a sense of humor, a basic support for a joyful mind is curiosity, paying attention, taking an interest in the world around you. Happiness is not required, but being curious without a heavy judgmental attitude helps. If you are judgmental, you can even be curious about that. Curiosity encourages cheering up. So does simply remembering to do something different. We are so locked into this sense of burden, big deal joy and big deal unhappiness that it's sometimes helpful just to change the pattern. Anything out of the ordinary will help. You can go to the window and look at the sky. You can splash cold water on your face. You can sing in the shower. You can go jogging. Anything that's against your usual pattern, that's how things start to lighten up. So today, um, this, I was or actually already, I, maybe you saw that, you know my comics thing. Um, but I think this is just brilliant. And I love Pearls Before Swine, and I don't know why. Uh, maybe you saw this one last week. Um, oftentimes, there's this recurring, the, the great wise ass on the hill. Um, and so Rat goes up and says, oh, great wise ass, what have I done to deserve the life I've had? And then uh, the wise ass says, the good parts or the bad parts? And Rat says, well, the bad parts, the good parts I earned. <laughs> and Rat goes down to Pig and says he was too speechless to answer. Um, and so I, I share this simply because we should just be on the watch to think that the good in our lives is as a direct result of the things that we've done, that we've earned the good, and then it's the bad stuff that we want some sort of cosmic explanation to, and, and the opposite as well. We don't want to think that the good is all um, somehow cosmic and the bad is just about us, um, but it's just put very pointedly when a character like Rat um, uh, puts it the way that he did. So uh, just one that I like to to hold up. So today, our last story that we're dealing uh, in our Bible stories for grown-ups is uh, updating our lenses. It's the story of healing the man who was blind. So we'll start by 
Um, just hearing the text, so I'll read, I'll read the translation from the Common English Bible. If you have uh, your Bible with, feel free to open, and then you can, it's always interesting to see how different translations uh, sound and how different concepts uh, get brought up. Someone was bringing up that the translation they were reading last week, whereas um, the one I was using said that the people were grumbling. I believe the term in the, a different translation was murmuring, so just kind of interesting. Uh, and that's also why it, it helps us understand that every time we read the Bible, the, simply the act of reading the Bible uh, is an act of interpretation. And even in doing the interpretation of reading the Bible, we're reading an interpretation of the Bible because every translation has had to make a lot of decisions as to how to get different concepts, words, thoughts uh, to be understandable to uh, a current audience. And even if we're reading the, the original texts, most of which uh, don't really exist in their entirety, uh, simply engaging any text, whether it's a written text or something we see, it's always an act of interpretation. So again, that gives lie to the idea that we can read the Bible literally. You actually can't, because everything we do is an act of interpretation. And that's a good thing. God has given us the gift of amazing intellect and insight. God has given us these real big brains, and wouldn't it be a denigration of God's gift to say, we're going to turn that off? Um, that's not, that's not what, what God invites us to do. So we'll start by uh, hearing the story uh, that we're focusing on today. Jesus and his disciples came to Bethsaida. Some people brought him a blind man, brought a blind man to Jesus and begged him to touch and heal him. Taking the blind man's hand, Jesus led him out of the village. After spitting on his eyes and laying his hands on the man, he asked him, do you see anything? The man looked up and said, I see people. They look like trees, only they are walking around. Then Jesus placed his hands on the man's eyes again. He looked with his eyes wide open. His sight was restored, and he could see everything clearly. Then Jesus sent him home, saying, Don't go into the village. So we have in front of us today what's a miracle story, this miraculous sort of uh, healing, because I guess Lasix didn't, uh, didn't exist back then. Um, that's a joke, um, <laughs> but it didn't exist. So, uh, and so as a way to think about miracles, sometimes it might be helpful to think about how the gospel John talks about miracles. John identifies them as signs. And sometimes it's helpful to have just a, a way to frame something uh, that, that help us uh, maybe come to a, uh, at least open ourselves to a different understanding. And so John talks about these miracles, but he calls them signs. And so then it's worth thinking about, you know, what does a sign do? What do signs do? You know, signs exist to point to something else. Uh, if you're driving along the highway and there's a sign that says, you know, wherever you're going, 15 miles. You don't tend to stop and admire the sign. If you do, I mean, it's kind of, it's usually bad news if you're on the interstate especially. Don't, don't stop on the interstate. Um, but the sign is there to point to something else. It's pointing you to your destination in this case. You're going to this place that's 15 miles away. The sign is pointing you to say you're on the right track. You're, you're going there. Um, you know, there's directional signs. There's speed limits. It's always pointing to something. Signs don't exist for the sake of themselves. And so... John uses that idea, and so maybe it's worth thinking, uh, John t uses that idea, talking about signs or miracles in that way. And so maybe when we encounter miracles, it's helpful to think about what, is, what are any of these miracle stories pointing to? Because otherwise it just becomes, well, that's good news for that guy, but what does that mean for anyone else? So that's why it's important to be careful about our own miracle stories, too, whatever they may be. Because I hear miracle stories, and it's great. 
I, I think miracles exist, and talking about what that means, that's a lot bigger conversation than we've got time for today. But it's always good to keep it in that, that bigger context to say, but what is it pointing to? That maybe it's something more than just what it, what it is. That maybe this story about the healing of this blind man isn't mostly about a blind man receiving his sight. That it's pointing to something else, something even bigger. So what we encounter in the text is Jesus and his disciples came to Bethsaida. Some people brought, him, uh, brought a blind man to Jesus and begged him to touch and heal him. Now, Bethsaida literally means house of fishermen. Uh, and again, in, according to the Gospel of John, that's where Simon Peter was from. So it's a, you know, it's a, it's a fishing town. That's where Bethsaida is. What I want to highlight, though, here is that phrase, some people. Some people brought a blind man to Jesus and begged him to touch and heal him. And this idea of some people, this isn't the first time that this has come up in Mark's gospel. So today we'll especially pay attention to the context within Mark. So we're going to kind of be uh, journeying through this gospel in some specific ways to see how this isolated story of the healing of the blind man fits within the larger story that Mark is telling. So some people, this isn't the first time some people have had an impact uh, or a significant role in the story, because back in Mark 2, we read this. After a few days, Jesus went back to Capernaum. Now, after Jesus <laughs> grew up and started his, his ministry, uh, you know, he, he left his hometown of Nazareth, and uh, you know, Capernaum became his home base. And so that's, um, you know, you may have had kids who grew up and moved away. Um, so Mary, uh, Mary knows, your, knows what you feel. That's a joke, too. <laughs> I'm sorry. Jesus went back to Capernaum and after people, and people heard that he was at home. So many gathered there that there was no, uh, no longer space. This is probably a familiar story to you. Not even near the door. Jesus was speaking the word to them. Some people arrived and four of them. So some people arrived and four of them were bringing to him a man who was paralyzed. They couldn't carry him through the crowd, so they tore off part of the roof above where Jesus was. When they had made an opening, they lowered the mat on which the paralyzed man was lying. So we have some people who were coming, and they brought, uh, four of them brought their paralyzed friend um, and did impromptu uh, deconstruction work up on the roof, taking it apart, lowering their friend down, and then the story goes on. Jesus forgives the man, which then makes the religious uh, folks really uncomfortable because only God can forgive sins. Oh, maybe there's something there. Uh, and then he says, stand up, take your mat, and walk, and the man does. So another miracle story here. But some people are, are, are who, um, I guess, instigate what's going on here in Mark 2. And that's the same thing then that's going on in Mark 8, that it's some people who brought a blind man to Jesus. So what that tells us is that in these miracle stories, in these healing stories, community is a key element. It's not just some people like a dismissive thing, but some people who, who cared enough to do this. There's a sense of community that's really important. Um, there are stories, you know, different churches have different traditions of kind of like what the right way of praying is. Um, you know, we have in our, we have a very liturgical tradition. So we tend to be very comfortable with, with written orderly prayers, Lord in your mercy, hear our prayer. It kind of, it makes us feel good. It checks the boxes. We color in between the lines and there's, and that's a valuable way to pray because sometimes when we've got those sorts of, um, that sort of structure, we, uh, we're more aware and have an openness to, to more things than just if we're coming up off the top of our heads. Others, other traditions find that as kind of too stilted, and so there's more like, we just want to be led by the Spirit. We don't want to prepare anything. We're just going to get up and, and, and pray and let the Spirit, and we see the, uh, what can be important in that. And so it's not that either way is right, just it's good to be aware of what our own 
predisposition is, and then to be open to other ways of praying. So uh, there were uh, especially individuals who have I've heard stories of folks who've, who've been you know, part of traditions where it's just, we prepare nothing, we just pray in the moment. Uh, but then someone who, was, uh, who found themselves in that situation, but then maybe there are times when we just don't have the words. We don't have the capacity because we, there's nothing within us that can, that can bring us into prayer for whatever reason. Maybe you've been there. And so the way I've heard it put is when, you know, someone who said, when I could no longer pray, I let the church pray for me. I think that's important. When I could no longer pray, I let the church, and that's Big C Church, pray for me. To say that we have words, that this community is important, that it's, it's about uh, some people, not just one person. Um, and one of the things that, that Josh Scott writes in his book that, that, we're, that I'm using as the structure for this class, he writes this, sometimes we need the people around us to carry us to say the words we can't find, and to remind us that we belong in all our complexities. So my hunch is there are times you've been among some people who have been bringing someone else into healing. And there are other times when you've been the one in need of healing, and some people have brought you towards that. And so I think that's just an important part. I mean, it's just the very beginning of this story, but it's, it's important to, I think, I think, to keep in mind about how important community is. And then it, it helps us perhaps step back and think about, as a part of a community, what kind of community um, am I helping to shape and to form? Like within your, within your small groups, would someone who's new feel welcome? Would they feel like a part of what's going on? Or would it feel like, man, it's going to take a while to get to, to fit in here? Or in the life of, uh, of the congregation, is it easy for someone to, to kind of be here and feel like they, like they belong, that they fit in? Or does it feel like, well, this is a club that I don't really belong to? I mean, these are just questions to consider, to think about what does community mean? And then how can we um, live out our calling as part of that community as well? All right, you didn't hear it. I mean, we, there's a lot more in here, so we'll keep moving forward. The next verse, Mark 8, 23, we, we hear, taking the blind man's hand, Jesus led him out of the village, which is an interesting thing. The people bring him to Jesus, and Jesus is like, all right, you all are good. I'm going to take you and go out here. Maybe that's a detail that you were like, oh, that's interesting. Or maybe you're like, well, whatever, let's get to the action. <laughs> But there's, a, there's this theme that runs throughout the Gospel of Mark, and perhaps you're, you've heard about it. If you have, great. If you haven't, that's not a problem either. Um, but it's Jesus, uh, it gets called the Messianic Secret or the Markan Secret, because especially in the book of Mark, it happens in the other Gospels, but it's more prevalent in Mark's Gospel. It's this idea that Jesus kind of has a secret, and, we're, and it's worth, and there's a lot of debate in kind of the biblical scholar community. It's, speaking of communities, that's a pretty small community. Um, but as to just why it, this is the case. But if you've got your Bibles, um, well, congratulations, you're at a Bible study, I guess. Um, but feel free to open them, to, and I'll read these verses in my translation. Uh, you, can, you can read along if you'd like. Um, but these are just some instances in the Gospel of Mark where we have this, this messianic secret pop up. And so Mark 1, verses 23 through 26, it says this, uh, Suddenly in the synagogue, a person with an evil spirit screamed, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are. You are the Holy One from God. Um, silence, Jesus said, speaking harshly to the demon. Come out of him. The unclean spirit shook him and screamed, then it came out. So it's interesting, of course, one of the things that happens in the Bible is that the evil spirits, the demons, however we want to talk about, they know exactly who Jesus is. They know right away. But Jesus says silence. I mean, won't, don't, I mean isn't that bad PR? I mean, doesn't Jesus want the word to get? I'm where he's supposed to go out and let the world know about Jesus. Why isn't Jesus helping his own cause here? 
Well, all right, let's, verse 32, same chapter, that evening at sunset, people brought to Jesus those who were sick or demon-possessed. The whole town gathered near the door. He healed many who were sick with all kinds of diseases, and he threw out many demons, but he didn't let the demons speak because they recognized him, which is interesting. Jesus is silencing, actually, the witnesses who knew who he was. I mean, sure, they're demons, but they, they knew who he was, which is interesting. And then later on in Mark 1, uh, starting at verse 43, uh, sternly Jesus sent him away. This is a man he had had, uh, healed. Uh, Don't say anything to anyone. Instead, go and show yourself to the priests and offer the sacrifice for your cleansing that Moses commanded. This will be a testimony to them. So even Jesus heals this other. There's no demons mentioned here. But then Jesus still orders the, the guy to, to go present himself to the priest. So that's just kind of the formal thing, part of the, the ritual of, of, the, um, the, of the cleansing. And Jesus says, don't say anything to anyone. And it continues as well. So then after our, uh, immediately after our text today in Mark 8, starting at verse 27, Jesus and his disciples went into the villages near Caesarea Philippi, which is a fascinating place for Jesus and his disciples to be. Caesarea, named after Caesar, um, you know, the Roman emperor, and Philippi, named after one of the, of the kings, both of whom, so it's, it's this, this town that's doubly named after these oppressive forces. Fascinating place. I mean, just think... I'm not going to, um, to, to name names, but to think about a place that would be named like, you know, Hitler Mao or something. I don't know. Um, on the way, Jesus asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? They told him, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, and still others one of the prophets. Uh, Jesus asked them, and what about you? Who do you say that I am? Peter answered, you are the Christ. Jesus ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Fascinating. So there's not consensus as to why there's this messianic secret. There's some ideas, and you probably can come up with your own, but a couple of the main ones are one is that there's this lack of understanding by his disciples and his hearers, that they They maybe grasp part of who he is, but don't know well enough to be able to um, articulately share or fully share uh, who Jesus is. Um, Our other thoughts that would see this as the messianic secret is that uh, this would be perceived as a threat to Rome because Messiah was both a religious term as the anointed one, but it's also a political term because that's where the, the, the Roman rulers would be anointed as well. So it would be seen as a, as a threat to Rome, and then this would undermine any of Jesus' uh, ministry at this point as well. So just a couple of the main thoughts. There's other things, and you can speculate on it and, and kind of dig into, well, why do you think Jesus uh, kept telling people not to t- say who he was? All right, now we get to the, just one of the oddest details in any of Jesus' healing stories. Clearly written pre-COVID, after spitting on his eyes, that's gross, Jesus. Gross. And laying his hands on the man, Jesus asked him, do you see anything? The man looked up and said, I see people. They look like trees, only they are walking around. So there's this healing, but it is incomplete. Which is why, because this is Jesus doing the healing, and the guy's still, you know, he can see, but it's blurry. He sees people, and he knows they're people, but they look like walking trees. So it's a very different, different thing that he sees. So, I mean, did Jesus, like, swing and miss? Was he just having an off day? You know, kind of what, what happened there? And I think that's, that's perhaps the crux of some interesting conversation here today, too. And I think this is where we'll focus most of our energy, at least, at least I will, for the, for the rest of our time, to, to figure out what happened. Because 
it seems like Matthew and Luke were kind of uncomfortable addressing this because in the, the healing of the blind stories that they have, Jesus just nails it on the first shot. There's no, you know, okay, we gotta, we gotta take another run at this. So it's interesting that, that Mark includes this. So of course, we've heard the story, but it continues, then Jesus placed his hands on the man's eyes again. He looked with his eyes wide open. His sight was restored and he could see everything clearly. Then Jesus sent him home saying, don't go into the village. So, you know, go home, but take the, take the side roads, the back roads. Again, it's the messianic secret. Jesus saying, you know, just <laughs> keep it to yourself. Fascinating, fascinating thing. All right, if you want to head your Bibles out again, we're going to start then putting this story within its context in Mark to try to see maybe the chapters around this story, the verses around this story can, can help us understand what's maybe going on with this two-stage healing because it seems like an, an unfamiliar thing for us. So first in Mark chapter 6... Um, should be a, a familiar story to you. Mark 6, starting at verse uh, 30, we have the feeding of the 5,000. We've got the apostles returning to Jesus, told them everything that they'd done and taught. Uh, many people were coming and going, so there was no time to eat. He said to the apostles, come by yourselves to a secluded, secluded place and rest for a while. They departed in a boat by themselves for a deserted place. Many people saw them leaving and recognized them, so they ran ahead from all the cities and arrived before them. So even though there's this messianic secret going around, uh, word is still getting out, which is fascinating. So maybe people aren't good at keeping secrets either. When Jesus arrived and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Then he began to teach them many things. Late in the day, his disciples came to him and said, this is an isolated place and it's already late in the day. Send them away so that they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy something to eat for themselves. So the disciples clearly are the, are the logistics team here. Uh, they're, they're Clearly, Jesus doesn't understand the logistics. The disciples have to come and say, okay, here we got all these people. Um, we don't have food. You need to send them away at this time in order, you know. So you need, you need a good event planner here. So he's got some, he called some event planners. Uh, but then verse uh, 37, Jesus replied, you give them something to eat. But they said to him, should we go off and buy bread worth almost eight months pay and give them something to eat? He said to them, how much bread do you have? Take a look. After checking, they said five loaves of bread and two fish. He directed the disciples to seat all the people in groups, and they were all having a banquet on the green grass. Uh, they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties. He took the five loaves and two fish, looked up to heaven, blessed them, and broke the loaves into pieces, gave them to his disciples to eat before all the people. He also divided the two fish among them all. Everyone ate until they were full. They filled 12 baskets with the leftover pieces of bread and fish. About 5,000 had eaten. So that's something that's, that's going on here. We've, and we, we see the disciples Wanting to send the people away, Jesus says, you give them something to eat. They say, you know, um, I think it's in Matthew's gospel where it's, again, the Bible is funny if we let it be. And I teach this at the First Communion Festival, and the kids get it, and they laugh every time. Um, because the disciples say, we've got nothing here but five loaves of bread and two fish. So they said, we got nothing and then right away are like, yeah, but, but we got something. Which then is an interesting thing because what it tells us is that God will use what's available. The disciples have a scarcity mindset to say, this isn't enough. This is the equivalent of nothing. And Jesus says, no, it's more than enough. Maybe that's something for us to consider too if, if we think that, if we get consumed by a, a scarcity mindset, that, that maybe God will use what's available. Um, the next story then is Jesus walking on the water. So, um, you know, a, a, a kind of this, this, um, this nature miracle that's going on, that um, interesting story. Then we get to Mark 7, this, this interaction with Jesus and a Syrophoenician woman. And I'll read it. It's such a, it's just an interesting story. Jesus left that, so 7, Mark 7, 24, Jesus left that place and went to the, into the region of Tyre. So, you know, he's, he's in, 
in, um, in foreign lands. He didn't want anyone to know that he had entered a house, but he couldn't hide. In fact, a woman whose young daughter was possessed by an unclean spirit heard about him right away. She came and fell at his feet. The woman was Greek, Syrophoenician by birth. She's an immigrant, folks. She begged Jesus to throw the demon out of her daughter. He responded, the children have to be fed first. It isn't right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Now, what is Jesus saying? But she answered, Lord, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Good answer, he said. Go on home. The demon has already left your daughter. When she returned to her house, she found the child lying on the bed and the demon gone. Fascinating. I mean, this, this would... I mean, you could write books about this and what it's about and, and what this interaction is and why does Jesus respond the way that he does? Was he testing her? Was she teaching him what's going on? And then what's Mark doing about that? So, um, but that's, that's something that had just happened as well. So we've got this other healing of, of this, this, um, this person who would typically be seen as not worthy of healing. In culturally, but the mother's persistence or, or you know, her advocating on behalf of her daughter at least uh, brings her to healing. And then we get to Mark 8 and we get another, it feels like, you know, a rerun or a sequel at least. Um, so, you know, Jesus is in this other region, kind of outside his home base. In those days, there was another large crowd with nothing to eat. Now, we've heard this story before. Jesus called his disciples and told them, I feel sorry for the crowd um, because they've been with me for three days and have nothing to eat. So this is Mark 8. I'm at verse 3. If I send them away hungry to their homes, they won't have enough strength to travel, for some have come a long distance. His disciples responded, how can anyone get enough food in this wilderness to satisfy these people? Interesting. And Jesus asked them, how much bread do you have? They said, seven loaves. He told the crowd to sit on the ground. He took the seven loaves, gave thanks, broke them apart, gave them to his disciples to distribute. They gave the bread to the crowd. They also had a few fish. He said a blessing over them and then gave them to the disciples to hand out also. They ate until they were full. They collected seven baskets full of leftovers. This was a crowd of about 4,000 people. Jesus sent them away and got into a boat with his disciples and went over to the region of Dalmanutha. So we've got then this story of the feeding of the 4,000. Feeding of the 5,000, important to remember, 12 baskets left over, not a random number. Feeding of the 4,000, seven baskets left over, not a random number. We'll get to that in a second. Because then we get to <laughs> the, uh, the, the text right before the healing of the blind man. So Mark 8, verse 14, uh, we'll pick up. And this is, you know, maybe ironic. I don't know. Jesus' disciples had forgotten to bring any bread. So they had only one loaf with them in the boat. So there's one loaf that was left in the boat. They all forgot to bring bread. After these two miracles, of course, fascinating stuff. Jesus gave them strict orders. Watch out and be on your guard for the yeast of the Pharisees as well as the yeast of Herod. Yeah, I've got it up on the screen here too. <laughs> the disciples discussed this among themselves. He said this because we have no bread. Because <laughs> they heard yeast. They're like, ah, that's a bread thing. That's a bread thing. <laughs> Jesus knew what they were, they should know by now. Jesus knew what they were discussing and said, why are you talking about the fact that you don't have any bread? I mentioned a couple weeks ago, I think, how in the parable of the yeast, that yeast is a, you know, seen as a corrupting agent, which is a fascinating image for the kingdom of God. But here, you know, it kind of tracks. So the yeast of Herod, the yeast of the Pharisees, those things that would come and corrupt rather than, uh, than, than keep you, you know, kind of keep you right. Uh, Jesus, I love, Jesus knew what they were discussing. I mean, they're on the boat together for one. I don't know how big the boat was. And that's, I mean, it's Jesus too. He's a pretty smart guy. He said, why are you talking about the fact that you don't have any bread? Don't you understand? Are your hearts so resistant to what God is doing? 
don't you have eyes? Why can't you see? Don't you have ears? Why can't you hear? Don't you remember? When I broke five loaves of bread for those 5,000 people, how many baskets full of leftovers did you gather? They answered, 12. I mean, they, they remembered. It was quite a day. Quite a day. And then Jesus continues, and when I broke seven loaves of bread for those 4,000 people, how many baskets full of leftovers did you gather? They answered, seven. So that 12, scholars are in great consensus that, you know, due to the location there within, um, um, within the region of, of Israel, the 12 represent the 12 tribes of Israel that there's enough here. And then the seven baskets, because Jesus was outside that region, and the seven baskets represent the seven Canaanite nations that Joshua was going to destroy. But instead, Jesus is here. That's from Deuteronomy 7. But instead, we have Jesus here feeding them, giving them life, not, not destroying them. So recall, we've got Jesus as Joshua 2.0. And what Josh Scott writes is, whatever Jesus is doing, it's not about conquest and exterminating the enemy. Instead, Jesus, the new Joshua, and his followers will feed, care for, and include their Gentile neighbors. So how many baskets full of leftovers did you gather? They answered seven. And then this next line has been proposed that it is the saddest line in the entirety of Scripture. Jesus said to them, and you still don't understand? You saw those loaves and fish feed 5,000 with 12 baskets full. You saw those, those seven loaves feed 4,000 with seven baskets left over. And you're still worried about where you're going to get bread. And you still don't understand. That's what had happened just before the scene with the healing of the man who was blind. So right after then, we've, then we've got the healing story, the man born blind. Remember, Jesus, <laughs> don't you have eyes? Can't you see? Don't you have ears? Can't you hear? Then there's the healing of a blind man. After that, we had Jesus say, who do people say that I am? We read that a, a few moments ago. You know, some say, say John the Baptist, others Elijah, others one of the prophets, but who do you say that I am? Peter nails it. You are the Messiah. You are the Christ. Jesus says, don't tell anyone. But, and then we get to these verses. Then Jesus began to teach his disciples, the human one, the son of man, must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and the legal experts and be killed and then after three days rise from the dead. He said this plainly, but Peter took hold of Jesus and scolding him, began to correct him. Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, then sternly corrected Peter. Get behind me, Satan. You are not thinking God's thoughts, but human thoughts. Satan here is not, it's not a, dynamic, a, a demonic term, term. Satan means the accuser, the tempter. And so... Peter is tempting Jesus to be someone other than Jesus came to be. So that's why Jesus is correcting Peter. Remember, Peter just got it right. He said, you are the Christ. You are the Messiah. Then Jesus explained what that means by, uh, by talking about his death and resurrection. And Peter said, no, 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 no. You don't get it, Jesus. And so it could be. So this is right after. Remember, we have this two-stage healing. I can see trees, or I can see people, but they look like trees walking. And then we needed the second touch. The first touch, there was some sight, but it was still blurry. The second touch, then he could see. Perhaps right here, Peter is in between touches. Like he's been touched the first time, but it's blurry. He can't quite see it. it he can kind of make it out. He can see it's people, but they look like trees walking around. He knows Jesus is the Messiah, but he doesn't, 
He doesn't know what that means yet. He's in between the first touch where his eyes begin to be opened and the second touch when he understands just what that means. So it could be that, that, that Peter here is, is in between touches. He's in this, this liminal space. The, you know, something's already happened, but it hasn't yet been completed sort of piece. We see it again, too, perhaps in, in Mark 9. The whole story is verses 14 through 27. There's this, um, this demon-possessed boy. Um, the man begs Jesus to heal him. And, the, you know, there's different translations of it. The father cried out, I have faith, help my lack of faith. I believe, help my unbelief, which is a great distillation of this idea of this father being in between touches. I believe, help my unbelief. I have faith, help my lack of faith. That both things can be true when we're in those in-between spaces, those in-between times, when something has started, but it, it isn't done yet. Um, we talk about our faith, our lives being in the already but not yet. Jesus has already been resurrected. We hear about that all Easter long, all year long, really. But the fulfillment of everything that that means has not yet come. So we necessarily, we're in between touches on, in this stage of history. It's already happened, but it has not yet been completely fulfilled. Already, but not yet. The, the first touch has happened. The second touch has not yet. And so maybe it's worth us thinking about this idea. And you could even talk then in your small groups today. Where are the, the places where we may be in between touches in our lives as, as individuals, as a small group, as a community, as families, whatever it might be, as a world? to say there's something that's happened, but, but the next touch hasn't happened yet. Like we've, there's kind of a, a dawning, but it hasn't been completed yet. We're at a threshold space, a, a liminal space. Where are those, those liminal spaces that, that we experience in our lives? Something has begun, but it is not yet completed. And that's kind of where we don't like to be in this in-between. I know I hate being in the in-between. I want it to be done, but a lot of life is lived is lived in between. Um, and so then as we think, just drawing all the way back, last thing I'll share is just thinking back about miracles. And I just want us to, to maybe broaden our framework as well, that, that miracles can be more than just something that seems very implausible or even impossible or difficult to explain in some ways. Because again, that if a miracle is truly a sign that's pointing to something else, you know, then what's the something else that it could be pointing to? And, and so there's, I just want to, I want to share a graph because I think this tells us, I mean, I think this gives us a picture of miracles among us. This is the life expectancy of people on this planet over the last, uh, you know, 250 plus years. And then different regions, so from, you know, the different colors are for different regions. You know, Africa is the blue that tends to be on, on the bottom. We have the entire world is the red. So if you just want to see what the, the average life expectancy in the world was, it was under 30 years from 1770. That's about as early as we could get, as, as data could possibly exist, uh, through about 1900. And then it starts shooting way up. Um, so that now, and in, in really it had only gone up until COVID, it went down, and it'll probably start going back up again. But if we think about all the things that have taken place, these are miracles. Because if any of us have broken a bone in our lives, you know, 300, 500, 1,000 years ago, we probably would be goners by now. Any of us who were born cesarean or who gave birth cesarean, goners. Think about everything else. Think about all the vaccines. I mean, who dies of polio these days? No one. Miracles. They're all around us. I mean, the, the, the statistics bear out. If, if we're over about 32 years, and I'm, I will admit I'm more than 32 years old, I mean, I would have, I would have uh, outlived my life expectancy 
um, you know, if, if we were living a few hundred years ago. And so what does that point to? Maybe there's this God who provides us this opportunity to use those big brains that God gave us, to put them to good use, that bring about life and fullness and, and health in ways that we never want to take for granted. And then we want to go out and share that as well. Um, that, that maybe we can, we can learn from the disciples and where they didn't understand, maybe we can have a, a dawning awareness at least as we, as we continue to, to go out and see the miracles all around us every day. Well, thank you so much for putting up with this for six weeks. Next, we, uh, next week, we got brunch, year-end worship. Thanks, everyone. Enjoy your conversation. Have a great week.